from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. His family was poor, nomadic, and happy. He was a track star in high school and got off to a great start at Notre Dame, but an accident laid him up for three months, and he was sitting around the house, bored, pouting, and his mother got fed up with him and said, you ought to do something. And he said, like what? And she said, like, write a novel. Well, the book he wrote that summer was never published, but it got him thinking in the right direction. And years later, he was happily married, had a great family and a good job, making about $40,000 a year. But he kept thinking he had to try again to be a novelist. So he decided to give it another shot. He spent six months working in the evenings on a manuscript. The notebook did pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Warner Brothers bought it for a million dollars. It stayed, on, it stayed for a year on the bestseller list in hardback and then another year in paperback. Message in a bottle, a walk to remember followed. He's now the author of 16 books, including a just-released one called The Last Song, a coming-of-age love story. But Nicholas Sparks also found a way to give back to young people. His gift of $1.5 million to the University of Notre Dame is used for scholarships and internships and fellowships. Please join me in welcoming Nicholas Sparks. Now, uh, for all you John Irving fans who couldn't get out, I, I don't feel bad if you walk out. I really don't. I, I've had that happen before, so it's okay. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank you all for, for coming. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my new book, Not Too Much, because I don't know. figure you'll read it or you won't. If you read it, you'll like it. I can tell you that, but... It's up to you. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and uh, some of the things that uh, dominate my own life. Because I figure if you're here, um, if I was here, and, I, and I've been here, I've been where you guys are today. I've been in the tent, and I got to meet some very famous authors, and it was very nice. I had a lot of fun doing that. And I asked them the questions that, you know... I didn't know if that was directed toward me there. <laughs> and so I figure I'll just tell you a little bit about me. Then I'm going to open it up for some questions. If you have questions about the movies or specific books or anything like that, we'll go ahead and cover some of that, uh, that information too. So let me start with the last song. Now, the last song, how did I get the idea? I suppose this is what everybody wants to know. And, you know, I've had all sorts of answers to that question over the course of the years because everybody says, well, where do you come up with your ideas? I say, well, I'll tell you. I've got a tree in the backyard, and it grows ideas, and when I, have, I need a new one, I just go pick it. Because really, that's, there's a magic to this that you don't understand. But I can tell you about the process, a little bit about the process that I used to come up with the story for the last song. Whenever I try to write, whenever I sit down to write a novel, for those of you who've read me before, I try to make each novel as different from anything I've done in the past as I possibly can. If you, for instance, if you've read The Guardian, yeah, thank you for those four people. Um, you know, it, that's very different than The Notebook. I mean, it's almost like two entirely different novelists wrote that, except that perhaps you like them both. I mean, that's really what I try to do, make very different novels. So one of the ways I try to do this is to vary the ages of the characters. Because by varying the ages of the characters, you vary the dilemmas of the characters. For instance, if I'm going to write about first love, these characters most likely won't be in their 50s. Because if you're 50 and you haven't been in love before, we got more to talk about. <laughs> so if you look back on the three previous books prior to the, uh, the last song, they were, I think, Dear John, The Choice, and The Lucky One. These all had characters in, in their 20s to their 40s. 20s to their 40s. Also last fall, I had a movie come out based on one of my novels, Knights in Rodanthe. <laughs> right? These were characters in their 40s and 50s. So there I was saying to myself, okay, I don't want to write a novel with the main characters who fall in love between 20 and 50. 
because that might feel too recent for most people. So I was thinking about this. I said, well, I can either do something more mature or I can do something younger. And I was leaning toward doing someone, a, another younger couple. I hadn't done that since A Walk to Remember. That had been about a teenage boy. Yeah. yeah. These are all my ringers I bring, by the way. They're all from North Carolina. Um, and so, the, so I'd written that book about a teenage boy, you know, 10 years ago, and I figured I was going to write one about a teenage girl. And that's where my line of thinking was when, coincidentally, a woman named Jennifer Gipgott called me. She said, hello, you don't know me, but uh, I'm with Offspring Entertainment. I am Adam Shankman's sister. Adam Shankman had directed A Walk to Remember. And she said to me, uh, Disney, we're working with Disney. Disney has a two-movie deal with Miley Cyrus. Uh, the first one is going to be the new Hannah Montana movie, Hannah Montana the movie, but she wants to do something different for her second one. She really loved A Walk to Remember. And so Adam and I were wondering if you had anything laying around. <laughs> and I said, no. But it's, but it's kind of funny you should mention that because that's kind of where I was thinking. So that all happened in June 2008. So I, you know, I, I began to think of the story and really work out all the, the, the different nuances of the story. And, that pro and I spoke to the folks at Disney and Jennifer again, I guess, at the end of June. And I didn't commit to the story because I wasn't sure it would come together as a novel. So I think some more. I guess by the third week of July... I had a fairly good story in my head. And so I was going out to Los Angeles to do some media four nights in Rodanthe, and I met with Jennifer and Disney, and I met with Miley Cyrus and the whole bit. And yeah, that was pretty cool, for those who are wondering. Um, and I basically said, uh, here is the novel that I'm going to write next year. I'm going to write this story. And I laid out the story for them. And then I went to the Cyruses, and I said, I'm going to lay, the, this is the novel I'm going to write. And it was funny, because you know, you know you're kind of moving up in the world when you just say, yeah, um, I got an idea. It's a pretty good one. And then the Walt Disney Company says, okay, we'll buy it. <laughs> I, mean, I had not one word written. You know, I'm like, I feel pretty good about that. But that's, that's beside the point. That, of course, fades. Anyway, what they did, though, was because of her schedule, they asked if I wouldn't mind writing the screenplay first. Because, see, no one else could write the screenplay because there's no novel to adapt yet because I, <laughs> I haven't written the novel yet. And so I said, sure, I'll write the screenplay first. Um, I already had the idea. So I wrote the screenplay first, finished that up in December. Um, then I started writing the novel, the novel that some of you purchased. Um, uh, it was, I finished it July 6th, by the way. That was the date. Uh, I know that's not that long ago. You might wonder, is that normal? No. You might wonder, are my publishers happy with that late deadline? No. But sometimes that's the way it is. They ended up filming the movie last summer. And I just, you know, they, it, it was scheduled to come out in January. Now the film is scheduled to come out in April. I think it's April 2nd. And so there we go. There was the last song. Told you. There we go. Um, what else is going on? I have Dear John. That was my book three, three or four ago. I don't know. Dear John. That's going to be a film also. Well, that it's already filmed. It stars Channing Tatum and Amanda Seyfried. That will be out in February. February. I think it's February 10th. And then The Lucky One, which was my novel from last year, that starts filming in January. So it's kind of, kind of an exciting movie time. I, of course, have another novel coming out next year. Next year, it'll be out next fall, and it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> I would tell you more about it, except that I don't have the title, for instance, and I haven't started writing it yet. <laughs> and I'm not even sure I have the full idea yet, but trust me, it's something. <laughs> anyway, that'll come next year. Okay, so... That's, that's pretty much the business stuff I wanted to talk about. 
anything, if you have questions about specific books, we'll come back to that and I'll, of course, address anything if you have questions about the notebook or anything. But now I'm just going to tell you something about me. I don't know if you're interested, but I'm going to tell you. Okay, what is it about me? I am, I'm married. I've been married for 20 years. Same woman, <laughs> if that counts. I met her on spring break in Florida. <laughs> told her the day after we met that we'd be married. She laughed at me, told me to get another beer. <laughs> and here we are five kids later. My kids range in age from 17 to eight. So it's 17, 15, nine, eight, and eight. Um, we live in a little town called New Bern, North Carolina. <laughs> and how do I spend my days? How do I spend my days? All right, let me tell you about the things that I like. And you might not like them, but I like them. I have dogs. I have four dogs. Actually, that's not true. I have two dogs and two fake things that my wife calls dogs that are just... <laughs> Those two dogs, my wife's dogs, are a Shih Tzu and a Cocker Spaniel. And the Shih Tzu is named Susie Q. And you know, when you're trying to walk Susie Q on her pink leash, I just, I just can't call that a dog. Because I have two dogs. Their names are Rex and Lara. Rex and Laura. Now, these are wonderfully trained German Shepherds. You might not like German Shepherds. I love German Shepherds because German Shepherds like to learn things. And if you have a dog that likes to learn things, you can train your dog to do fun things. So among the, the, the great tricks we have for our dogs, I might have a friend over, for instance, and we'll be watching the ball game, and I'll bring in some plate of snacks and I'll sit down and I'll put it there and I'll go, oh man, hey Rex, go get me a fork. My dog will pop up and go race into the kitchen, open the drawer, grab me a fork, bring it back to me, hand it to me. And of course, I'm doing all this while never taking my eyes off the screen. And my friend is kind of like, did your dog just get you a fork? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, done yours? <laughs> my dog can climb a tree. <laughs> I have one of these trees with all these little low branches, okay? And, and train the dog to pop up the branches around. So my dog sits about 15, 20 feet off the ground in the tree, <laughs> right out front of my property. Now, they're mean dogs. I mean, they're protection trained. They're fun. But they sit up there. <laughs> you got to see the walkers and the joggers. They're coming by. And you're like, Rex, Rex, get down from that tree. Just get down. <laughs> they're looking up there like, here comes the dog down the tree. I just find, I find this amusing to me, okay? <laughs> I never said I was a bright man. I, this is, I, I, like this, I like to laugh, and I just like to see people's faces when a dog climbs down a tree. <laughs> I don't know why. I play with my dogs. I train my dogs. I spend a lot of time with my dogs, probably about an hour and 15 minutes a day between their exercise and their training and stuff like that. I actually have a dog bite suit that I make my oldest son wear. <laughs> I let him take off and let the dogs out. It's fun. I like to do that when he comes in after curfew. <laughs> and then usually he's pretty good for a couple weeks, because, uh, but that's that. Of course, he never gets hurt. He loves it too. He's fast, my son, so he puts up a good race. It's part of how I spend my days. What else do I like to do? I coach track and field at the public high school level. I coach at New Bern Public High School. This is just a regular, we only have one high school in my town, so that's why I coach there, one public high school. And I will say that I've had a lot of fun over the last four years. I'm not going to belabor this point, but we were actually pretty good. Um, I coached, you know, last four years, we won four state championships, but we won't even talk about that. Although they're the first four the high schools won in any sport, but that's beside the point. 
Let me tell you about what we did last year, because last year was a lot of fun. And this is why the book was done July 6th, because I had to travel so much with this team. It was a team that was great in a lot of different events, and we ended up running a lot of relay events, too, like the 4x100 and the 4x200. Now, we largely competed in seven different relays. My team was not very big. There were only eight people on the team. It's a very small team. And of the people who ran on these relays, there were four. Now, we largely competed in seven different relays. In these seven different relays, Little New Bern High School was the fastest high school team in the United States in all seven. <laughs> Not too bad. In addition, we, did, uh, we, were, uh, we went to the national championships and we won all seven at the national championships. Also, of those seven, in three of them, we broke the national record, which means we're the fastest team ever in the history of high school. Of the other four, we finished all time in the history of high school, number two, number three, number five, and number 14. So, like I said, it was a pretty fun year. So there we go. <laughs> Takes a lot of my time. It's where I am two hours every afternoon, and many of the weekends in the spring, I'm off in Pocatello, Idaho, or Little Rock, Arkansas, or Blacksburg, Virginia, not signing a single book, but holding a stopwatch and cheering on my team. So that's where we are. What else do I do? What else do I do? My wife and I, a few years ago, started a private school in New Bern, North Carolina. It's called the Epiphany School. It's grades 5 through 12. We graduated our first class last year. This was very exciting to us. It's a lot of work. By the way, starting a school, that's a lot of work. You got to get teachers and principals and the whole ball of wax, classes and curriculums, the whole bit. Took quite a bit of our time over the last three or four years. Um, we graduated our first class. It was only 16 students. The school's now much bigger. It's growing and growing. But our first 16 students graduated. I think they, between the 16 of them, they pulled down about $1.7 million in scholarships, which is about a little over $100,000 a student. It's a Christian school, but you don't have to be Christian to go there. We have no statements of belief. Um, it has more to do with the way you lead your life toward kindness, toward others, and service. Um, it is a college prep school, obviously. And it's a school that really emphasizes being a global school. And that's a big buzzword but we really try to make it reality for these students. For instance, if our students learn about the Holocaust, which they do in their sophomore year, not only do they learn and read the books and read Diary of Anne Frank and all that, but then we literally put them on the plane and fly them to Poland, Germany, and Czechoslovakia. They walk around Auschwitz and Dachau and Birkenau. They spend time in Krakow and different places like this. Now, it's very important to me. I've had the good fortune to be able to travel around the world, and I've learned something from all of these different cultures that I've been to. And I live in the rural South. We're not cosmopolitan like Washington, D.C. I'm in the, I got people who never leave the county where I live. We keep the cost as low as we can, so it's open to all students. It's about the price of daycare. I think it's about, I think it's 5,800 a year. But at 5,800 a year, if you come in as a freshman, you get a tremendous college, edu college prep education. And by the time you graduate, you will have visited 23 countries on six continents, spent 213 days abroad, and you'll be fluent in Spanish due to the immersion program we require. It's just one of the things. See, yeah, I know, I know. That's the kind of school I wanted to go to. Um, it's really fun. Here's the great thing about starting your own school, by the way. You get to make all the rules. You're like, yeah, I think that's important. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> and they're like, but, but nobody does that. You're like, yeah, and? <laughs> so anyway, that's, uh, that's another way that I occupy my time. Of course, I have five children, so that takes a lot of my time. And so the rest of my time between all of this stuff is writing. So I'll just give you a little picture of writing, then I'll open up to some questions and then I'll be gone. What is writing, if you're a novelist like me? A novel every year. Let me tell you. I'll put it into numbers because it's easy to understand. A typical novel that I publish is about 90,000 words, okay, 90,000. 
for me to get those 90,000 that I keep, I have to write about 140,000. Then I delete and, you know, and I'm working through. So I write 2,000 words a day when I write. So you figure that's about 70 days of writing. Now those 70 days are not 70 days straight. They might be 70 out of, you know, 100 and, 110. So it's about four to five months to write a novel, not working every day. Those 2,000 words take me about five hours to do on average. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's seven. I type 70 words a minute. What does that mean? It means I'm writing 400 words an hour, but I type 70 words a minute. So writing is essentially this. I type for about six minutes per hour and then spend 54 minutes every hour leaning back and staring at the six minutes that I've written <laughs> and trying to fix it. And that's really what writing is, for me anyway. And I just throw that out so that you know, people might wonder, do I sit, does it flow? Oh no, I require one of those chairs that leans way back <laughs> so I can put my feet on the desk and contemplate. And it's quite funny because you know, I might even move away from the computer for a while. I'll go lay in the hammock in the backyard. And my sweet wife will sometimes come to me and she'll say, Hon, hon, would you mind taking out the garbage? And I'll say, can't you see I'm working? <laughs> anyway, that's it. We're going to do questions for a couple of minutes. And then that's all for me, folks. <laughs> questions? I'll do this one first and then over there. Hi, Nicholas. Um, Hello. I'm Kira. And I know that you shape a lot, uh, that you name a lot of your characters after your children and your loved ones. And I was wondering if you um, shape the characters' personalities like after your children or if that affects it at all. Um, sometimes you draw characters from a lot of different uh, people that you know. So it really depends on the book. But for instance, in the last song, if you look at Will, the main character, Will, he's a lot like my older son, Miles. There are some differences, but that's really where I drew his character from. If you look at Jonah, who's the younger boy in that novel, he was drawn from my third son, Landon. Landon. Kyle, in The Rescue, many, many books ago, that was my second son, Ryan. Haven't written about Lexi or Savannah yet, but they're only eight and they're not quite interesting enough yet. <laughs> Just because they're little, I could say they're really sweet, but what do you, you need more to a story for that. Other, other characters have been drawn from my parents or uh, my brother, people that I know. Question? Oh, she wants to know how I got to North Carolina. That's all. Because I, I, uh, I, I, I was born in Omaha, largely grew up in California, went to college. At, yay! Went to uh, Notre Dame, went back to California. Now, when my wife and I were married, my wife and I, she was very clear when we got married that when we had little kids, before they would be in school, she wanted to be able to stay at home with them. Okay? It was a very reasonable thing to me. Not maybe a permanent thing, but till they're five or something. However, I was a sales rep at that time, and California was very expensive. Real estate was still very expensive back then. So for us to consider living the American dream, so to speak, to be able to afford a house, remember this is back when interest rates were higher too, um, we had to move to a less expensive area of the country. So after that, we said, we have to leave California. Where are we going? After that, I'll tell you what, we based it on weather, I swear. I was like, well, we don't know anybody, so what's the other thing? Weather. Well, I don't want the snow. She didn't want the rain of the northwest. Neither of us wanted the desert. You kind of eliminated it all the way down to this pocket of about five states, Tennessee, Kentucky, North and South Carolina, and Virginia. So I put in a transfer to all of these places, and my company had an opening in eastern North Carolina. I took it sight unseen. We up and moved and stayed there ever since. That's how I got there. Question? Um, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Okay. Uh, Jane, you get a mic here? Yeah, no, never mind. It. 
Okay. Hi. Whoa. Oh. I uh, wanted to take advantage of this moment to thank you for your memoirs, the three weeks with my brother. Thank you. It, it really touched me quite a bit. Uh, I think we have a lot in common. I have lost my parents when they were when I was young, and so I just wanted to share that with you and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did. Um for those of you, again, who are stuck in here because of the rain and you have no idea who I am, I really am famous. <laughs> I'm kidding. I, no, I, what I was going to say is I wrote a, uh, a memoir, and it, it's not really a memoir. I find that a kind of a vain term. It's a story about brotherhood. It's called Three Weeks with My Brother. It chronicled a trip around the world that my brother and I took, but in between... It, told, it, it, it showed who I was, where perhaps I got some of my story ideas. But most importantly, it was the story about family and how important family is. Because to be quite honest, I got really tired of reading memoirs where if you weren't a politician or a celebrity, the only way you could get a memoir written was if you had a horrible, horrible childhood. Just horrible stuff. I said, you know what? Maybe if you... <laughs> I don't know. If you write it well, maybe, uh, maybe you could pull it off. So that was a story that, uh, that meant a lot to me to write as well. And for those of you who haven't read it and you've never read me before, it might be a good place to start. Oh, I'm in overtime. One quest. That's it. See? Time flies, doesn't it? That's it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.